judges call it an indictable offense. One of the sons of Ali Smote diomed over the mouth again, and nobody objected. There was a little something after all in his thought that fortune hardly favors Jones. The sons of Ali fell back on the code of Sikandaram, which calls for incredulity at all times, but particularly when a Hindu makes a proposition. They looked what they were exactly men from out of town. The smiter rubbed his knuckles. Ye speak riddles, said the spokesman. You understand that they who might set you at liberty, ignoring authority, would have the power to overtake and kill. Asked the man in yellow. It began to dawn on Sikandaram that these were overtures for a bargain. All three faces closed down in accordance with the code that decrees a bargain shall be interminable and he who can endure the longest shall have the best of it. But the men in yellow were in haste. One of them drew a long silk handkerchief from hand to hand with a peculiar, suggestive flick. You understand that for all advantages there is a price. Go free. But but, said the officer. The finger on his sleeve commanded silence. He obeyed. Go free, in the fear of Kali, wife of Shiva, the destroyer. Go free, until a day of reckoning. When Kali asks the price observe. As if one thought functioned in the minds of all three, one of the men in yellow stepped toward the gones and taking him by the shoulders jerked him to his feet. The gones was too astonished to defend himself. Have I not offered, he began, but the second of the three in yellow pushed him sidewise, so that he reeled backward on his heels toward the third. There was a motion of the handkerchief, as quick as lightning but less visible, and Diom fell unpicturesquely dead a heap of something in a soiled check shirt and crumpled collar so dead that not a muscle twitched or sigh escaped him. For a death there must be a death, said one of the men in yellow. The teeth of Sikandaram flashed white in a grin of pleased bewilderment. He he, he didn't slay your yellow man. We did it, chuckled the spokesman. The thug was at no pains to explain his beastly creed. It was better to leave the three less cultivated savages to speculate on what the sacrifice had meant. His point was won. He had impressed them. They had seen the swiftness of the silken death. Undoubtedly they would soon begin to ponder on the fact that Diomed was slain in the presence of an officer of police and to couple that with another mystery. Go, let them go, ordered one of the three, and the officer began to fumble with the lock. He flung the door open with an air of petulant impotence, and it struck the cell guard, who had crept back to listen. The door hit his heel as he ran and one of the three in orange-yellow stepped out into the corridor without the least suggestion of surprise. He beckoned him. Not a word was said. The second not he with the handkerchief held out a hand to warn the sons of Ali that freedom was postponed. The first man continued beckoning, and the cell guard kept on coming, carving at the charge, as if he intended violence. But he stepped into the cell with his eyes fixed in a stony stare, as if he had been hypnotized. It was the second man's turn to beckon, and as the wretched, rash, intruding fool obeyed the unspoken call of Nemesis, the third man used the handkerchief. The cell guard fell in a heap on Diomed. The officer picked up the carbine mechanically and laid it on the bench. Now go, said the spokesman, motioning the hillman out with a gesture worthy of the angel of creation bidding the Eons begin. Kali is all seeing, ye cannot hide, Kali is all hearing, ye may not tell, Kali is unforgetful. Therefore, when a price is set pay swiftly even as ye saw this man pay. He laid a finger on the officer's sleeve who trembled violently. For if not, ye will pay as these did. He signified the corpses with a gesture. Go. So the three went, wondering, not troubled as to what the official explanation would be, of three murders in a cell and three lost prisoners. The newspapers next day might call that mystery. To them another mystery was paramount and all-absorbing, who were the men who had released them. Where had they learned that skill with a handkerchief? Why had they slain Diomed? And why had they three been released? Moreover, what would the price be that was mentioned, and would they three Muslims be justified in paying it, suppose they could, to the priests, of a Hindu goddess? How much would they dare tell to Ali, their ferocious sire, considering the silence that was laid on them? And if they should tell Ali, and he should tell Jimgrim, for instance, and Jimgrim should consult the others, would the priests of Kali visit vengeance on themselves as the fountainheads of disobedience? There was more to it besides. If Kali was all-seeing, as the three had warned them, did that simply mean that they were being followed? He in the middle faced about suddenly and walked backwards with his arms in his brothers, but he could see no Hindus in pursuit. They tried a score of tricks that Hillman used when the stones are lifted in the valleys and the shooting one another season has begun tricks that the hunted leopard tries to assure himself that he has left the hunter guessing wild. But though they hid, and strode forth suddenly from doorways, so that passers be jumped like shying horses in fear of highway robbery, they detected no pursuit. 
The man in yellow lied to us, said one of them at last. They let us go, and that is all about it. But why? They were afraid. But of what? They could have killed us easily. Nay, none slays me with a handkerchief. By the bones of Allah's prophet, they could have slain the cell guard in the passage, and could then have shot us with his carbine through the hole in the iron door. They were not afraid of us. Nevertheless, we three are afraid of them, announced the brother who had spoken first. The other two did not dispute the fact. I say if we are wise we will hold our peace a little while and wait and see and consider and if perhaps there should seem to be a need and an advantage then later we might tell. What say you? Allah, who put wisdom into thy mouth? It is wisdom. Let us consider it. They agreed to use their own term to leave the proposition belly upward for a while. Chapter 9, Silence is Silent Cyprian was not in a quandary. He would have known what to do, but his 80-year-old lungs were too full of a sickly-tasting gas for him to function physically. That which is born of the spirit is spirit, but the brain must wait on material processes. He was just then in Jeremy's keeping held in the Australian's arms being thought for by Jeremy. And as the stars in their courses once warred against Caesarea, circumstances and his reputation combined to trick Cyprian. Never would it have entered Jeremy's head that dignity, discipline, responsibility to some one higher tip were necessary ingredients of Cyprian's code. Having saved the Padre's life the only other thing that Jeremy considered was the game. Then there were the neighbors. Right and left were locked go-downs stored with merchandise. Opposite, behind shade trees and a wall were gones, who would not have thought it moral, expedient, polite or safe to interfere in the Padre's doings uninvited, even supposing they had seen what was going on and the heat prevented their seeing anything, for May was merging into June and none who could afford to stay indoors dreamed of venturing forth. The remainder of the street's inhabitants were Muslims with a sprinkling of Hindus at the lower end, and every one of those knew Cyprian by reputation as a student, and perhaps a practitioner of black magic a man to be feared, if not respected, moreover, a man with influence. Nine out of any ten of them would have looked the other way if Cyprian's house were burning down. The tenth in nearly every instance would have run as far away as legs or a bicycle could take him. The constable, whose duty it was to patrol that street, having quitted himself well with one arrest that morning, retired to a basement cellar to brag of his doings and gamble on fighting quails. On top of all that there undoubtedly had been some deliberate clearing of the street by influences never named but referred to, when spoken of at all, as they. The street was as peculiarly empty as it sometimes is when a royal personage is due for assassination. The obvious course for a man in Cyprian's position, with three would-be assassins in his cellar and his whole house full of anesthetic, was to report at once to the authorities, leaving subsequent developments to take their course. But Cyprian was in no condition to give orders, and none of the others, King included, cared to invoke official skepticism. No man, who confesses to himself that he is searching for a heap of gold as heavy as the pyramid, and for the books that explain how the heap was accumulated, is exactly unselfconscious when official investigation looms among the possibilities. There was furthermore Narayan Singh, unconscious in itself an almost incredible circumstance, for that doughty Sikh is a drinker of notorious attainment and less likely than any of them to succumb to fumes. He had keeled over like a gassed canary. King and Grimm were giving him first aid, considering his recovery of vastly more importance than any debatable obligation to call in the police. They knew the police for mere bunglers at best and sheer obstructionists as far as true inquiry was concerned. They knelt on the sidewalk one each side of the Sikh, who breathed like a cow with its throat cut, and Jeremy, holding Cyprian like a baby in his arms, came and watched. If you can make him vomit, he's yours. He advised, get something functioning no matter what. One natural process encourages the next. Meet him in the solar plexus. King and Grimm, having tried all other methods, experimented with Jeremy's. Damn it, there's an antidote if only we could lay our hands on it, said King. I've heard about this stuff saw its effects before. It's a capsule as big as a rupee. They puncture it under a handkerchief. The minute the air gets to it the contents turn to gas. Beastly stuff burns the skin as it emerges, but changes again as it spreads and becomes anesthetic. The thieves who use the stuff carry the antidote with them. It's all in one of Cyprian's books. If Pop, you de wake, suggested Jeremy. But Cyprian only sighed. Where are the three Hindus? Grim demanded. In the cellar. Ali pitched him in their first class job. Chulander goes is sitting on the hatch to keep him out of further mischief, Jeremy announced. Ramsden where's Rami? Grim demanded. Here. Jeff, with a cloth about his face well drenched in water, had been exploring the floor of the sitting room on hands and knees for evidence that would explain the enemy's method. 
He emerged through the front door, panting. Gas is disappearing, he gasped. Rami, Narayan Singh is going west. Get a move on. Get those three Hindus. Make him produce their antidote. Stop at nothing. That was grim with the mask off dealer in fundamentals. So the purple patch that was the shadow of Jeff Ramsden ceased from existence on the white wall simply ceased. He can be swift when occasion calls for it. Within, where more or less silence had been, was a great noise as Jeff's weight landed on the trap and that of Chulander goes, capsized, complaining. Off the trap, lively. Ali of Sikandurum and his sons had been lying belly downward listening in vain for noises from below. Imagination yearned for cries of pain and half invented them, but the door was too thick and sat too tightly in its bed for even their fond wish to get itself believed. By Allah I swear I broke the legs of all three, boasted Ali, face to the wood. But he said no more, for Ramsden seized him by arm and leg and threw him clear, the sun scampering away on hands and knees before the like indignity could happen to themselves. Then Ramsden got his fingers into the only crevice, strained, grunted, strove and gave it up. The door and frame were jammed hermetically. Crowbar. Ali sickened him to employ their estimates scattered in search of cold iron, while Jeff continued torturing his fingers vainly. One of the sons came in from the street on a run with loot from a Muslim go-down. Blood on his forearm told the story view of a crowbar through a window action acquisition. Good, said Ramsden, and the woodwork began splintering forth with old teak, as dry and hard as temple timber, ripping apart with a cry as if it lived and desired to live. Get a rope or a ladder, Ramsden grunted. Out on the sidewalk, under Jeremy's running fire of comment and advice, Narayan Singh had vomited and was showing other signs of resuming the burden of life, as Jeremy had prophesied. Cyprian, on the contrary, had fallen into the easy sleep that overtakes old folk and infants, so that Jeremy, sniffing to make sure the gas was all gone, carried him inside presently and up the narrow stone stairs to the first floor bedroom clean, simple, severe as a monastery, yet comfortable, since only the needless things were missing. The head of the bed was backed against an iron door that was papered over, white like the rest of the walls, with an overlapping fringe to hide the telltale crack. The legs of the bed were set tight against wooden blocks screwed down to the floor, with the obvious purpose of reinforcing the lock that was low enough down on the door to be hidden by the bed frame. Jeremy noticed how tightly the casters were jammed against the blocks, as if they had been subjected to tremendous pressure, and it was that, as he laid Cyprian down, that caused him to scrutinize the door more curiously. He is sure of his senses, having trained them. Too used to deceiving others' eyes he disciplines his own. He could have sworn that the door moved inward by a fraction of an inch, that is to say toward the wall and away from the head of the bed. He tested it, after making sure again that Cyprian was sleeping, and discovered he could get the fingers of one hand in between the bedpost and the door. And there was a long mark on the wide paper covering the iron door, in proof that it had recently pressed outward against the bed. So either the lock was unlocked, or it did not function, or else it had been locked again since he entered the room. Curiosity eats Jeremy like acid. He must know or be miserable. Mystery merely whets appetite. With an other glance to make sure Cyprian was sleeping, he cautiously pulled the bed clear of the wooden blocks and rolled it a yard along the floor. Then he stooped to examine the keyhole. There was no key in it, and there had not been, for it was still stuffed with soap, and a piece of white paper rubbed onto the soap was in place Cyprian's modest effort at constructive camouflage. On the floor lay an irregularly oblong sliver of white stone two inches by an inch. The door had been forced from the inside, recently. Jeremy tore back the paper from door and wall in two considerable strips. The tongue of the old-fashioned lock projected not more than an inch into unprotected stonework and was merely resting now in a neat groove that the fallen sliver fitted. Nothing on Jeremy's side, that is prevented the door from swinging open. He tested it with his fingers. It refused to yield. And he could swear he had seen it move when he first laid Cyprian on the bed. He glanced at Cyprian, half inclined to wake him glanced at the iron door again and speculated. Probably the old boy keeps his books in there. Shock might kill, if he wakes and learns thieves are in the coop. Sleep on, Melchizedek. Knowing the danger to himself of using firearms, in a country in more or less perennial rebellion, where the carrying of modern weapons is forbidden except for sport, Jeremy looked about him for an implement less compromising to himself. In a corner, behind a creton curtain under which the Padre's garments hung, he found an Irish blackthorn walking stick a souvenir of Ballyshannon days, where Cyprian once did temporary duty. The stick was as strong as a professional shalala with twice the length a deadlier weapon than gun or sword in given circumstances.
Downstairs, Ramsden broke up the trapdoor section by section, layer by layer. It was so thick and so well carpentered that nothing less than absolute destruction laid the hinges bare. By the time it was possible to reach the bolt, that swung in place across the whole width of the trap and bit into 12-inch beams, there was no more sense in fooling with it, for the door was totally destroyed. Jeff used the bolt for a purchase for his rope, the sons of Ali having failed to find a ladder, and went down band over hand into the dark. Not even the eyes of Sikandurim could see more than an unexpected red light, and trash heaped in a mess below, but there seemed to be less of the trash than when Ali had flung the three into the pit. Where a pile of boxes had been, that should have lessened Jeff's descent, there was nothing to meet his exploring feet and he had to drop the last yard, for the rope was short. The next they all knew was a roar like a bull's as Jeff joined battle with an unseen foe, and that was followed by an increase of the crimson glow and the indrawn roar of a furnace. It was like a glimpse into the bowels of a great ship, or into Tophet. Come on, help, you fellows, was all the explanation Jeff had time for English at that a sure enough sign he was excited. King left Narayan Singh and Grimm's hands came on the run and swung down the rope like a sailor. Then Chulander goes was next, so curious, as he explained it afterward, resembling a seaman less than any other being in the world, first jammed in the broken trap like a cork in the neck of a bottle breaking the hold of the woodwork by sheer weight and strength then suddenly descending with the rope like red-hot wire between his hands, to fall the last yard and be met as it seemed to him by an ascending floor constructed of upturned splinters. And down on Chulander goes in that unfortunate predicament there dropped Sikandurim in swift succession, sire and sons grateful for the cushion but to Allah, not the Babu and stepping off without pausing to pass compliments. At the cellar's farther end there was a door down, and the whole of Cyprian's arrangements for the eventual holocaust of black books were plain to see in the light of a galloping fire. The holocaust was prematurely born. The three had set the match that was to have been Cyprian's torch on his last pilgrimage. The books, stacked hundreds in a pile inside an ancient pottery kiln, were all alight and the glue in the backs of some of the more modern ones was priming for the rest. Cyprian had stacked ample fuel under them in readiness, but to that the three had added trash. There was no fire door to be shut to exclude a draft, the furnace jaws gaped wide. The chimney at the junction of Cyprian's house and the go-down was serving its ancient purpose, and the trap door that Ramsden broke was letting enough draft to feed the ravening fires of Eblis. Out on the sidewalk Grimm saw the shadow of sulfur and black smoke belching from the summit of the old quiescent kiln, Narayan Singh was left to do his own recovering, and Grimm, guided by instinct, took the stairs four at a stride instead of plunging like an ifrit into Ramston's broken hole. He was just in time to see Jeremy swing the blackthorn down two-handed on the back of a head that emerged for reconnoitering purposes through the cautiously opened iron door. The blow would have cut the head clean off if the weapon had only been an axe. A man in yellow fell face forward and his shoulders prevented the door from shutting, although someone tried to pull him back in by the feet. Simultaneously Grimm and Jeremy seized the iron door and wrenched it wide open, and a stab like a fork of lightning missed Grimm by the thickness of a moonbeam mist and was not quick enough, for Jeremy brought the blackthorn down on a long knife with a serpent handle, disarming a yellow, invisible someone, who dropped whatever else he held and retreated into deeper gloom. Cyprian slept on, moving his lips and old fingers as if dreaming. Jeremy, all trusting in his own luck, signaled past the blackthorn into Grimm's hand and reached for matches. Grimm agreed with him. With their feet they shoved the victim of Jeremy's weapon back whence he had come and stepped through over him, closing the iron door at their backs. Then Jeremy struck a match in time exactly in the middle of the nick of shaven time. The blackthorn came in use again crack on a wrist that thrust upward with another such knife as the first man had tried to sting with. The blow broke the wrist. Someone smothered an exclamation. Curse these matches, exclaimed Jeremy, and struck another. On the floor of a closet about ten by ten lay two of the three. The man whom Jeremy had first struck was dead undoubtedly. The other's leg was broken Allie's work and now the wrist was added to his inconveniences. He was writhing in pain, though making no noise, and all mixed up with the dead man. Evidently two of them had been carrying the fellow with the broken leg, and the third had run back through a door that faced the iron one a rat in a stopped run, panicking this and that way. Jeremy struck another match and Grimm tried the inside door. As he laid his hand on it the fugitive, finding retreat cut off below, came charging back and Grimm recoiled against the wall, guarding with the blackthorn like a single stick. The man in yellow lunged at him with a knife such as the other two had used, but as he lurched forward with his weight behind the thrust the point of another knife knocked his upper front teeth out and cut through his upper lip, emerging an inch or two, then turning crimson in the flow of blood. 
through the opened inner door came red light glowing and diminishing glowing and diminishing silhouetting Ali of Sikandaram. It is all in the trick of the thrust, Sahibs, announced Ali, stooping over the victim to withdraw his beloved weapon. See the neck is broken thus the point of the knife goes in between two vertebrae, and all odd is the rest. What's that fire below there? Grim demanded. The old kiln, Rami Sahib. What's burning? All the priest's books praise Allah. Grim's face looked ghastly in the waning red light. In that moment he saw all his hopes go up in smoke and flame. There'll be a blaze through the top of the chimney by now that'll bring the whole fire brigade. He announced with resignation. Not a bit. Trust Ramsden, said another voice. Athelstan King came up like a stoker from a ship's inferno, more than a little singed and sucking burned finger ends. Ramsden found an old sheet of corrugated iron underneath the litter and bent it to fit the fire door. The draft's in control. It was hot work. And the books? Grim asked him. Napolo, no more books. Where's the padre? Fast asleep. When he learns this it'll kill him, said King with conviction, unconsciously confirming Jeremy's first guess. Ramsden came up the narrow stairway and demanded light. The glow behind him was so low that his bulk in the door obscured it altogether. Grim cautioned him and opened the door into Cyprian's room. The light fell on Ramsden's singed beard and his clothes all charred in patches. All red ash now, he whispered. No more smoke. Jeremy tiptoed into the bedroom and stood looking down at Cyprian. Presently, he felt his pulse. Fever, he whispered. He's unconscious. Ramsdell gathered Tip the man with the broken wrist and leg and laid him on the floor in Cyprian's room. They all trooped in, followed by Ali and his sons, Chulander goes last. The Babu was the only one who showed any symptoms of contentment, although he, too, was singed and burned about the hands. Expensive consideration for man with family on microscopic stipend. He remarked, removing a burned silk turban and readjusting it. What shall do next? None answered. None knew exactly what to do. One of Ali's sons, the youngest, succumbed to the weak man's impulse to invoke the blessing of the platitudes. Silence is golden, he announced sententiously. Oh, excellent advice. Oh, God, out of a greasy inbox. Oh, Oracle. Chulander goes exclaimed. All the wisdom of all those wicked books is incarnated into this fool. Silence is not only golden, it is silent. Silence is as silence does. Verb very sap. Oh, Sahibs, let us muzzle all these men. Shut up this shop until darkness intervenes, then beat it. In jargon of Jim Grimm, Sahib, same expressive very. Beat all concerned, this prisoner included unless the gives us every information, plus. Plus what? Asked Ramsden. Plus obedience not like these sons of Himalayan mothers, whose only virtue is that they economize by sleeping mostly in the jail. Ali was over by the window, looking out into the street. My sons are here, he announced grandiloquently, trying to hide a grin. Where? Outside. Call them in. King snapped. We don't want more publicity. Ali threw the window open and beckoned. The sons came lumbering upstairs like half-trained animals. Tell the sahibs, how did you leave the jail? Demanded Ali. Maybe intuition warned him that they had a splendid lie all cooked and ready to serve. We fought our way out. See, we left our knives in the guts of the police. Each of us slew three men. Allah, my boys, my sons, exclaimed Ali. The others all looked down at Cyprian. Jeremy took a towel and put water on the old man's parched lips. None, not even Ali as much as half believed the story of the fight with the police, but all knew it was based on lawlessness of some sort that would not add to Cyprian's peace of mind when he should recover consciousness. If he pulls through this, the worry and disappointment will kill him anyhow, said Ramsden, rather ignoring the circumstance that for upward of eighty years Cyprian had been training himself to withstand the slings of fortune. We might give the old boy a chance, suggested Jeremy, and in his eye there gleamed antipathy and mischief. Ali was still at the window. Lo, a constable, he announced. He observed smoke issuing from the chimney without a ticket. Asterisk, lo, he speaks with Narayan Singh, who lies to him. A child can tell you when a Sikh lies. Lo, he writes a report in his pocketbook. Asterisk, asterisk, there will be a summons before municipal magistrates. I know the custom. Asterisk, ticket, the English word is used to mean any kind of pointed and numbered permit. Asterisk, asterisk, pocketbook. Narayan Singh, a little weak yet as to equilibrium, came upstairs and thrust his head cautiously through the bedroom doorway. There will be a summons for smoke nuisance against a Hindu, name of Mergandas, he announced with a grin. Grim caught all eyes, glancing from face to face, as a captain measures up his team in an emergency. Did the policeman appear suspicious? 
he asked quietly. Fairy, Narayan Singh answered, he suspected a Hindu of seeking to avoid payment of fee for necessary permit to use furnace within municipality. I confirmed his plausible suspicion, hoping. Anything else? Grim asked him. No, Sahib, nothing else. You fellows game. Grim caught all eyes again. If they were not game, none are. There were all the brands and all the elements of that guy's that is all conquering because it simply cannot understand defeat. Two courses, Grim announced. We can call in the police and quit. Chulander goes side like a grampus coming up for air. Or we can carry on and face the consequences. Vote please. Those in favor, Chulander goes raised both hands, all the others won. Eyes have it. Very well. Then after dark we'll take these two dead yellow boys and plant them where their friends put Dogama. Meanwhile, take Cyprian somewhere and get a good doctor for him. Don't say who he is. Ali, you and your sons guard the prisoner while we find a good place to hide him in. Chapter 10 Can't hatch a chicken from a glass egg. That night there stood in front of Cyprian's an ox cart tented and painted to resemble the equipage of old-fashioned country gentry's womenfolk. Chulander Ghost had conjured the thing from somewhere, magnificent Guzarati bullocks included, selecting the form of conveyance least likely to be interfered with by police. But to make assurance on that ground doubly sure there was Narayan Singh as driver, naked of leg and otherwise garbed as a Hindu, reinforced by Ramsden and two of Ali's sons, the latter shaven, and so angry at having to adopt Hindu disguise that it would have called for a whole squad of constables to arrest them. Directed by Ramsden the corpses of the two followers of Kali were laboriously trundled by the oxen as far as possible in the direction of the scene of Dogama's death and thence carried by Ali's protesting sons who dumped them naked into the debris where the Portuguese had lain and rolled the same broken pillar over both of them that once had helped to hide Dogama's remains. Judged as corpses they would have looked more edifying in the Orangilo smocks they wore in life but smocks dyed just that color are not purchasable in the open market. Thrift is thrift the careful use of opportunity. In another part of Delhi a more dangerous negotiation was proceeding, rendered no easier by the almost unconquerable yearning to fall asleep that was the natural consequence of two nights wakefulness in Punjab heat. It was Jeremy's proposal. Grim had seconded. King demurred. Chulander Ghost had so squealed and chuckled with approval, vowing the whole proposal a stroke of genius better than the gods could think of that King gave in. They drove the still unconscious Cyprian, wrapped in a blanket, to Gori's house and lodged him there a member of an order of strict celibates in the house of a lady of Rahab's trade. What's the odds? He doesn't know it, argued Jeremy. The lady was over ears and eyes in delicious responsibility intrigued until her fat ribs shook with giggling unaware of the patient's identity, for they had put him into a nightshirt, but as sure as that the stars were shining, that life her life as she loved it was being lived. If you hold your tongue you shall have for yourself one full share, equal to that of each of us, in whatever we discover, Grim explained to her. But let one hint drop, and you eat my knife, said Ali, and Gori believed both of them. In all lands where the laws are written for the benefit of privilege there are smugglers not only of contraband jewels and rum, but of contraband knowledge and skill. There are men, who belong to no certified profession, who can do as well for you in the way of experience, and at half the price, as any blockade runner can in the matter of lace or tobacco. No license confers skill, any more than payment of the duty improves art. Many a doctor, barricaded from our pitched out neck and crop from his profession knows more than the exclusive orthodox. But he has to follow Esculapius and Galen in peril of imprisonment and fine. That is the point. He must not talk. None knew, and none cared, why Dr. Cornelius MacBaron might not any longer use the title legally that his patients conferred on him gratefully, whether the law approved or not. For one thing, he was in Eurasian 5050 Caledonian Light Infantry on one side, and a dark mama no sinecure to go through life with. So he might not choose. What people said to her concerning him he had to tolerate, extracting now and then advertisement, more profitable than solacing, from the scandalous even if merited slanders of the regular professionals. It was brooded abroad in Delhi behind the drugstore counters and in mess rooms and elsewhere that at absurdly reasonable prices Cornelius MacBaron would cure anything and what's more, hold his peace. He was said to have quite a wide following and to know more secrets than a banker. Whatever he knew and whomever he recognized, he said nothing when brought in a cab in broad daylight to the gory scandalous abode. With the long, lantern jaws and raw bones of a Scotsman, sad brown eyes, and in his...